This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. This episode is brought to you by new green tech company, Harvest. The company's recently launched smart web-connected mini greenhouses are designed to help people grow more at home with less effort and minimal space. Choose between the yard and the terrace. Both are simply popped directly on the ground or patio. They're self-watering, climate controlled, space efficient and enable you to grow your own produce without the need to tend every day. So whether you're a budding beginner or a seasoned pro, visit www.harvest.co.uk and take advantage of a 5% discount on all four seasons and eco mini greenhouse orders from now until the end of July. Simply enter the code Roots and All, all uppercase, at the checkout. This week's episode is a little bit different, as it's a recording of me chatting to Daniel Fuller of the Brilliant Plants Grow Here podcast. Although we may be geographically antipodean, there are a lot of similarities between Roots and All and Plants Grow Here, as Daniel and I both cover a wide range of horticultural topics, including those on the fringe, and we both love a bit of geeking out. Although, as you'll discover in the episode, Daniel's topics are perhaps slightly less haphazard than mine. So join us as we dive into the world of podcasting and gardening. You're on the Plants Grow Here podcast. I'm Daniel Fuller. Come along with me as we enter a hidden world of deep horticultural, ecological and landscape gardening knowledge with featured experts, industry professionals and enthusiasts. I'm not just a podcast host, I'm also a massive podcast fan. And I've been listening to one called Roots and All for at least a couple of years now. I reckon that Sarah Wilson is one of the best gardening podcasters out there, and in this episode, we're lucky enough to have her on the show. G'day Sarah, welcome. Thank you very much for having me on. Usually I go into all my episodes with like a plan, but for this one I thought, I don't know, let's just, like, what do you want to talk about? Oh, what do I want to talk about? I would like to know a bit more about your experience podcasting, actually, and the type of guests that you have on. So if if we could touch on that, that would be awesome. And from that, I, I, I don't mind. Whatever you feel like. Let's just go off the cuff. I love it. So <laughs> my podcasting experience really started... Well, as a, oh, it started a long time ago because as a consumer, I've sort of been consuming podcasts for, it must be three years now at least. So once I sort of turned onto podcasts, I was really hooked. And I think that the audio format's really something that I resonate with because I like to fill moments that are full of mundane, repetitive tasks like mowing as a maintenance gardener. I like to fill that time with like something that I can bring to myself value. So podcasting like just fit with me. So, and your podcast was actually one of the first ones that I kind of got onto and I thought it was really awesome. And I really loved everything that you were doing it. The first one that I remember, cause I remember, cause I remember the feeling of how mind blowing it was just that this was possible was your episode, uh, onion family. What are they called? Oh yeah. Alliums. Alliums. Yeah. And that, and I mean, I learned so much during that episode and I just thought, wow, what an awesome format. So I guess that's where it really started. Then when I sort of took the step into creating a podcast was during the Melbourne lockdown. So I, I'd really considered making a podcast for quite some time before that. And I'd been making a blog before that too. So I had about 50 articles on the blog, but it was always going to be a podcast. I just needed to get my head around what the hell to do because I had no idea what I was going to do. Like I had no idea that it was going to be an interview format or I didn't know what it was going to be. I just knew that it was going to be about horticulture. So, yeah, during lockdown I started cold calling in brackets. It was actually cold emailing, basically like business owners, landscaping, horticultural, ecological and stuff like that because I wanted to build an, an article and I wanted to have sort of some of my own research to back it up. And my question was, would you rather hire someone with a qualification and no experience or lots of experience and no qualification. And one of the guys actually got back to me, Ben Sims from WA. He's on the Landscape Industry Association of WA. He's a board member. So I I was impressed by that. And um, he sort of got back to me and said, yeah, like 
what what are you all about? Like, tell me about your blog. And so I told him about the blog and he said, can I join? Can I come on as a business manager? And yeah, we sort of talked a lot about it. And yeah, I let him on. And that was just to kick up the bum I needed to start the podcast. And so that's how it evolved into the blog evolved into launching a podcast because I just really needed Ben there, I think, to give me a kick up the bum to just actually go out there and achieve what I wanted to achieve. You had also asked me, like, what sort of guests I get on, did you say? Mm. I guess experts, industry professionals and enthusiasts in horticulture, ecology and landscaping. So it's quite a broad net. That's the most talking I think yeah. I've ever done Do you- on this podcast. <laughs> I know. I'm interviewing you, aren't I? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, It's interesting, though, because I was thinking about, you know, the state of gardening in and horticulture in the UK. And I think actually things, the tide is turning. And I think it's been a long sea change, but we are getting there with in terms of gardening in a more ecological, sustainable way. How do you feel it is where you are? I see what the UK, like, because I'm on Twitter and I see things that are happening in the UK and I'm really excited by your hashtag no mo may, I think it is. So basically the no mo mm. idea, I think that's great. I don't know if it works in Australia because we have snakes and stuff like that. But, yeah, I just see heaps of stuff happening in the UK and I'd, I don't know if we're quite here with, with Australia quite yet um, in a lot of ways. Like a lot of the customers I work for, they, it's just – I probably shouldn't say brand names, but it's chemicals. That's what they want. And trying to educate people on that and also trying to educate employers on that and other staff members working within the same company not to undo your work by using chemical pesticides. I just don't know if most people are there yet. I feel like I'm a bit of a hippie whenever I try and bring up integrated pest management ideals. I really feel like there's a fear still. That's how I perceive it, that there is a fear around letting go and just relinquishing that control over your garden space. And I think people worry that if they don't keep things in check, you know, there's there's so many things that come to bear on that. Probably, you know, kind of social pressures, people looking at your garden and Mm -hmm. thinking, oh, you've just made, you know, you've made a mess of that or you've let that go to the point where it doesn't look good anymore. And people think that if they let plants grow, then they'll get so big that they won't be able to manage it. And yeah, I just think it's a, it's a whole kind of, a whole kind of fear and and of the unknown. And there's not enough knowledge for people to be able to handle their own gardens. And in a way that it takes a bit more of a kind of hands-off approach and requires a little bit more informed editing. So I think in certainly in the UK, we've lost that knowledge where probably my grandparents were gardeners but very much in the kind of 50s bedding tradition where they had a real suburban back garden and everything was neat and the lawn was edged and you know they had a few flower beds and some bare soil in between the flowers and they but they (laughs) definitely knew how to grow plants and so my great-grandparents one of them was actually a nurseryman and they knew how to grow plants they knew how to grow food plants but then my mum's generation, although she kind of she did work in the nursery trade, she very much lost that connection with having a garden and knowing what to do with it. And now she comes to me to ask me advice about her garden. And I only know because I took up horticulture as a second career. Had I not done that, I still would be bumbling around in my back garden, killing plants mm. and <laughs> and making a mess of things. So I think probably we are now maybe two, three generations removed from that knowledge of how to Mm. properly look after an outdoor space and how to kind of garden in tune with nature and the seasons and all the rest of it. So I think that uh, the more we can do to bring knowledge to people, the better. And if we can kind of give that knowledge a slightly, you know, as I say, eco-friendly bent to it, then all the better. Uh, So I suppose that's what I set out to do when I I did the Mm. podcast because I saw a lot of... Um, other podcasts and TV programs, magazines, just trotting out the same old stuff that was, you know, that we'd seen, you know, 10 years on the trot maybe or Mm -hmm. five five tips for good tomatoes or something. You know, there's only so many tips you can give about tomatoes. Sometimes you just got to get out and do it. So Mm -hmm. I think I like to inspire people to just try things and to know that it doesn't always work. So I think that's where I'm coming from with my podcast. Yeah, I'm definitely picking that up. 
So if somebody was just starting gardening as a hobby, they've literally never planted anything before and they're coming to this podcast and they're totally new, what are some of the first things that you would recommend that they learn? I think, although this is maybe not necessarily a popular opinion at the moment, I do think it's good to get a real handle on your local plants and your local mm. growing environment. You know, there is the kind of anti anti indigenous plants movement, which is really uh, I can hear rumblings of. Yeah, but but it is important that you do understand where you happen to be in the world at that point in time and where you're gardening, because if you don't, you're always trying to impose this kind of global framework on your garden hmm. that doesn't necessarily fit with the things that kind of naturally occur in that space. So I'd say that's really important. And that can be just as simple as having a walk around your neighborhood and seeing what your neighbors are growing and going in and asking them about it and seeing what arrives, you know, just taking a bit of time to actually find out what your space is about and and what will pop up if you just left it alone. And again, it's mm-hmm. that you have to relinquish some control and you have to be a uh, able to sit back and have the patience to sit back and say, okay, well, maybe for this year, I won't mow that patch of lawn or this year, I'm not going to slavishly weed under that tree. I'm going to just, you know, let let the plants come in and see what comes up. So, and then beyond that, really, I think it's, you, you do have to educate yourself. Nobody is born a gardener. We have to, we have to get the knowledge and it is our responsibility to do it. You know, we do need to know what we're dealing with in terms of plants and the environment because if we don't how can we ever protect it so if there are no quick fixes I think and I know that's again maybe not a popular opinion but there is just no shortcut you you have to kind of put the legwork in and take the time to observe it which we're not any of us probably very good at these days we're just rush through rush through things and, and want instant results but gardening isn't really conducive to that no I totally agree you're not the first guest to come on this podcast and make the point that sitting back and observing the garden is one of the most important things that you can do because you can see where the light's coming from. You can see which part gets soggy, you know, walk around, check out different parts of your garden, look up close, look from far back, look from different angles, you know, because the garden can look different at different times of the day and at different angles. And, you know, maybe you might think this, for example, you might think the soil's wet every time it rains because the top of it's really sloshy. But if you take your finger and dig down beneath the soil, you might find the soil is actually very dry. So you might actually find that you have water repellent or hydrophobic soil. Taking the time to view your garden is an incredibly important thing for any gardener. Mm. Yeah. And I think the other thing that you know, is one of my personal bugbears. And again, was one of the reasons I started the podcast is because gardens are never portrayed realistically. I, and I don't care what you look at, whether it's a magazine <laughs> or a flower show or a public garden or a TV program, they don't show you what things really look like. So no garden looks good 12 months of the year. There's always times when you look at it and you go, oh God, it looks terrible, but you know, it will come back and it will look good at another time. Mm -hmm. And so it's being realistic as well. It's not trying to pretend that gardens are these 12 months of the year, unmoving exhibition pieces. They're just not. And you just, you have to get real about it you have to get real about how it's going to look um and enjoy the kind of small sections of it that happen to look good at that time rather than sitting back and going you know um, and worrying looking out the window and thinking oh this looks you know this doesn't look coherent it's possible to do it but you have to have such a lot of time and so many resources and and especially in the uk we've got this tradition of garden visiting and maybe big stately homes national trust properties you know, that they, they all look fantastic because they have this big team of gardeners and not only paid gardeners, but also countless volunteers who go and make sure that this garden looks good 12 months of the year. And it it takes up so many resources, both economic and material resources as well, to get these things to look so good. So we have this wonderful kind of romantic view that all gardens look amazing and, you know, oh, look at our lovely rose gardens. Don't we have the best gardens in the world? And yeah, we do, but we really work at them and it costs a lot of money. So, um, you know, it's, I suppose it's not trying to reach that, not always trying to reach for that kind of lofty ideal. That's, that's not a real garden. Mm. That's a really good point. I'm kind of a bit of a hippie, as I said, and like, I'm more than willing to overlook a few aphids on a tree if it means we can avoid chemicals. You know, 
the plants are just going to be so much better off if we just love them on their own terms, essentially. Yeah, agree. I mean, like you say, you just have to take the rough with the smooth. And I do really see that coming through in the books that I'm reading and the, you know, various kind of things that I, maybe I get a, a particular skewed view because that's what I go seeking out on social media and things like that. But I do definitely see a thread running through now that says, okay, yeah, there's aphids on my ball beans, but actually they're also going to feed, mm. you know, some other invertebrates. So that's okay. We can accept that. And there isn't that urge, I don't think so much, to reach for the pesticide mm. and spray everything to within an inch of its life. I do still come across it, but all we can do is people that like you and people that listen to your podcast and my podcast is just kind of go out. And if everybody starts spreading the word that actually, you know, there's a different way of gardening and it's okay to do it, then... You know, I think that slowly we will chip away at that mentality. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that that's just the way the tide's moving, the way humanity and culture is just moving in that direction as far as I can see. It's just going to take time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly that. So let's change direction a little bit now because I have sort of think that you're a really good person to ask this question that I think about a lot. Do you think that the way people are educating themselves on all topics is changing now that we have the internet? I'm, I'm maybe not a good person to ask. In a way, I am because I've just set up an online garden school. So I'm thinking that a lot of people are learning stuff online. Although that said, I don't necessarily learn in that way myself. I, I don't know. I mean, what can you do at the moment in order to educate yourself or what have we been able to do given all the lockdowns? It has been completely online. You know, there's, I've done a lot of kind of a, mm. lot, a lot of reading of physical books, but also a lot of listening to audio books and podcasts. And so I guess that's all education. But in a way, I suppose I've quite enjoyed going back to the paper books because we have mm. been maybe stuck in at weekends, whereas we might have otherwise been outside. So. I think everybody's on a different journey, really. Mm. But I'm very much looking forward to getting back out. And funnily enough, I was talking to a friend who'd had a really nice birthday present of basically some cash. And she said to me, what can I do with it? And I said to her, well, you know, you could go on holiday, but then she she goes on holidays anyway. So that's fine. You know, that that wouldn't be anything out of the ordinary. And I said, well, why don't you take Mm. maybe a year or two years and almost kind of set yourself like an agenda to learn because she wants to expand her gardening knowledge to learn about Mm. lots of different things so maybe one weekend you go to our uh, place where we have our national fruit collection and you do one of their fruit tree pruning courses because you know that's going to be the best that there is out there and then on another day maybe you could do like a floristry weekend in London with a renowned London florist you could do you know all sorts of things like that just little bite-sized chunks almost like continuing professional development but doing it for fun. So now we're opening up. I, again, I think people are maybe itching to get out and do these physical courses and to, to be on site and see the things that they've that they've seen online over the last uh, year or so. So yeah, I don't I don't know. I think everybody's journey is different. What how about you? What do you think about that? I think that you I really agree with what everything that you just said. So I think yes, there's four so there's different types of education the way I see it. You've got formal education, and yes, the internet has changed the way that we're doing that because during COVID, obviously, all of the institutions were able to go online. And so can you imagine, I mean, I can't imagine how that would have gone without the online thing. I think everybody just would have had to halt or just risk it and just carry on as we were. So then there's also informal study. So I guess you'd call that books. You know, no one's going to give you a little sticker after you finish reading a book, but and yet you have your world may have been changed. Like, Botany in a Day by Thomas J. Elpel changed my life. Just that whole thing, it's all informal, but now I know how to identify plant families using flowers. So, I mean, no employee is going to look at my resume if I put, um, you know, no one's going to give me a special sticker for reading that book and I can't put that on my resume. But I think with online, informal education has become a lot more accessible to people the danger is you need to find a reputable source because there's a lot of misinformation on the internet. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. There is. That's very true. Yeah, and I suppose you only know to be discerning about it the more the more knowledge you get. Yeah. So it's a bit of a vicious <laughs> circle. 
I mean, I don't know about you, but I do my best not to spread misinformation, but I know that there are things that are going to fall through from time to time. And I mean, I'm only human and so are my guests. Yeah, absolutely. I had somebody kind of make a comment on my YouTube channel, which was I should have pressed somebody further when they made a claim. But to be honest, I don't see myself as an interrogative interviewer. That's not my job. My job is to get people to put their viewpoint across and then for the listeners to make their decisions about how true it is and how correct it is. And that's my, I don't really, maybe it's a bit of a cop out, but but I feel like I'm I'm giving people to a degree a platform and then they the, the listener has to decide whether they want to buy into that information or not. And there's guests sometimes that I don't agree with And there's guests that sometimes I think everybody ought to just fall at their feet and worship, but I hope that doesn't come (laughs) across too much. You know, I just kind of asked the, I asked, I asked the questions that I would want answers to myself um, as a gardener and, and that's it. That I, you know, what, what people do with them with that information is up to them. Yeah, totally. I really value differences of opinion too. In episode one of our podcast, which is our mission, basically like a two or three minute mission statement for Plants Grow Here, I mentioned that, uh, you know, we value contrasting opinions because they help build a wider understanding. And to me, that kind of means like if you hear two different people who disagree on something speak and you just actually just stop and don't try and fight them and you just listen to them, even though they may not agree, you might actually find that you actually kind of agree with both of them. And then through hearing those differences of opinion, you are better able to make your own choice about what you believe or about how you should approach a certain thing in gardening. Yeah. I mean, I'm always open to having my own opinion challenged and I can have one opinion and then do a 180 and completely go the other way. And some people might think, you know, that's a bit... um, mealy mouth but I I just like to be always acting on the kind of the most recent information that I've got and and I always like Mm. to challenge myself and other people and in doing so my opinion may well change and there's things I did when I started out gardening and I look back and Mm. I think oh god like did I really think that or did I really believe in that Mm. and I'm sure there'll be a point five ten years down the road where I go wow, did did I really believe that? Or did I think that was the right way? So (laughs) I try not to be too prescriptive and to other people and try not to, you know, try not to be too steadfast on my own beliefs and uh, beliefs and cling to them Mm -hmm. when, you know, maybe that's not, not the right thing to do. It is interesting as a podcaster, because you and I both are making editorial decisions based on the guests that we have. And so that is a responsibility in itself. I mean, how how do you feel about that? I feel it as a huge weight um, because I think of Plants Grow Here as being an educational podcast. And for me to get somebody on who doesn't know how to teach the particular topic that I'm asking them to teach my listeners about, I'd be devastated. You know, I don't have to find necessarily, like I don't believe in finding the best guest for any particular topic. Because I think you can play that game forever until, you know, you're always sacking people. I just want to find someone who's good enough to teach a beginner and who I can build a rapport with and who's nice to listen to. But most importantly, it's that they understand the topic well enough to teach my listeners about and that I can know in my heart that I've done what I can to source the right person. Like, I don't know about you, but I actually source a lot of my guests myself. Like, I'll go into university staff lists and stuff like that and try and find someone who's the right person to speak about integrated pest management or I'll go on to YouTube and try and find someone who's already talked about it or I'll rack my brain and I'll go through all the people who've helped teach me. So like, you know, before I said Thomas J. Elpel was someone who blew my mind and helped me identify plants to the family level using flowers. Well, I got I reached out and I got him on the show because I just thought like, you taught me so much, let me help you teach other people sort of thing. I guess that's how I approach it, if that mm. makes can make any cohesion. <laughs> no, it completely makes sense. And it just makes me giggle, really, to think about how disorganized my uh, guest sourcing is in comparison. Mine is totally serendipitous. So I will have wow. something pop up in my Instagram feed, or somebody will message me, or I will get sent a book, a review book, 
or you know there, there's like a million ways that my guests arrive and there is no there, there may have been in the beginning I certainly did seek out people that I really respected and I, and I still do that to a degree that you know there are people who are kind mm. of maybe on my little list and I think I must speak to them. I just think they're amazing and I love what they're putting out into the world. But uh, most of the time now, it just, these things kind of fall into my lap and, I, and I'm and i like a kid chasing a butterfly. I go, oh, yeah, that one, I, I want that one. And then I want that one. And then I want that one. So yes. it, it, yeah, and even if I get to the point where I think, oh, I really ought to start thinking about what my next guest topics and things should be. Something will always land in my lap. So I don't even get the chance anymore to do that. So, yeah, sorry, completely disorganized, not at all like you. <laughs> well, I would take that as a great sign of success because if you're following your bliss, I think your listeners are going to be able to hear that. Good. Well, yeah, that's a really nice way of putting it, and, and I hope so. Are there any guests who are on your, like, highest of highs of people who you would love to get on? Like, for me, it's David Attenborough. If I could get David Attenborough on, I would just, like be very happy with that is there anyone who would be like your just your dream guest i would very much like to speak to robin wall kimmerer and i have approached her pr person and she is too busy at the moment so i think probably i won't manage her anytime soon but yes she would definitely be i think up there on the list i've never heard of her she wrote she wrote a book called braiding sweetgrass and then another one about moss and the title escapes me. She is a lecturer in the US and she kind of writes about nature and the natural world and also teaches it from a scientific point of view, but very much informed by uh, indigenous knowledge. So she's crossing that kind of boundary between those two, with what might be seen as slightly diverse platforms or, or, or points of view. And she brings them together in the most amazing way. And I, her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, is just fantastic. It, you know, it made me cry. It made me uh, despair of the human race, you know, but it gave me hope. It's just an amazing book. And I really, I think she is just doing the job that I would like to do, you know, kind of saying to people, this is, this is all, you know, peer reviewed stuff. It's all you know, borne out by facts and figures, but also don't turn your back on this kind of knowledge that's been around all this time. And actually the fact that we can tap into nature and learn from it, you know, in and of itself. So yes, she's, she's definitely my, my dream guest. It sounds like you feel something that I feel about nature, which is kind of hard to describe. When I say nature, I mean, just, I guess, just like being out in the space, just enjoying the plants and enjoying the sounds and the wind and the breeze and the sky and stuff like that. There's something deep within us that responds to, I guess, what colloquially would be called nature. Yes, there is. And interestingly, I've just interviewed someone who's done an exhibition, uh, co-created an art exhibition at the Camden Art Centre, and she has. it's called The Botanical Mind. And it is about that how we kind of perceive and interpret the, the shapes and symbols and sacred geometry of nature and then feed that through into our lives and how we get connection from it and how we've lost that connection. And, yeah, we do as humans relate on an innate level to, to nature and sometimes we don't know why and we may never be able to quantify why. But you can't, I don't think, deny that it exists. And it's when we try and deny that it exists, really, that I think we fall into problems as a race. Absolutely. I think we're very lucky as gardeners to be working closely with it rather than um, sort of sitting in a box somewhere totally separated in in a white and grey. I mean, I don't want to say prison cell, but, I mean, I've been there and that's what it felt like. Yeah, me too. I used to work in a basement and uh, I couldn't see light, natural light or anything green it was just there was a tiny door at the end of the office and it looked out onto a gray stone courtyard and I mean at the time I thought it was fine I, I don't mind that actually I'm one of these people who if it's raining out or if it's a bit chilly I will quite happily go and sit indoors and 
you know, get myself into a little corner and just huddle away. But I also need to be able to get out. And I think it's having that balance for for me, certainly, and probably for most people, you need to have a little place where you feel safe and can kind of nest in, but you also need to be able to open the door and go out. And you also need to be able to do that when, as and when you feel that you need to do it. And that's my issue with standard kind of nine to five jobs in offices. You, you in most offices you just can't get up and walk out if you if you're feeling a bit crappy or you want to just have a break you have not got that flexibility to say okay well I'm going to listen to my body and get outside and that's why I value being self-employed so much I think that I can just actually set my own agenda and work to how I'm feeling even to the day you know I can say right okay well this day my body doesn't feel up to it I don't feel up to it mentally I need to do this today and if we could all do that you know, as individuals, I think probably we'd all be a lot happier and a lot more well-balanced. Not saying that I am, you know, 100% (laughs) well-balanced, but it's definitely helped me compared compared to where I was mentally when I worked in an office. I've done a total, you know, turnaround. So, yeah, speaking again, personally, it's it works for me. I can totally relate. I mean, I got into gardening after a sales position. Um, I mean, I... Went to uni out of school, um, studied for a year and a half for town planning, and then my now wife, then girlfriend, pointed out to me, Daniel, you're setting yourself up here for a career that you don't really want to do. So I guess that sort of like sparked a bit of a journey of me trying to find what I wanted to do. And, you know, I found gardening, but at first I was like almost feeling like, oh, this isn't for me because I was just doing a lot of push mowing lawns and I thought that that wasn't going to be the career for me. but it turns out that after spending a few years there, I realized this is actually something that I can do and I may as well just double down on this because this is here and I actually can enjoy it And if I make the decision to. And, yeah, now, you know, like in the past I would have been thinking that I almost like I was too good to rake up someone's leaves or, you know, mow their lawn, you know, out of high school as a little snot-nosed teenager. But now as I'm a little bit older and more mature, I just think I couldn't be luckier to be doing those things because if you just let yourself, you can be really happy being outside in the sun, working with your hands, taking your time and creating something beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. That's, um, yeah, that's really true. And I think probably I was a bit similar. I had, um, I came from, I come from very much a working class background. I probably looked and thought, oh, well, you know, do I want that life? No, I don't. I want something a bit more glamorous. I want something a bit more well-paid. I don't want just a manual labour job. I don't want a, you know, kind of stereotypical job. I want to chase the bright lights. I want to do this, that and the other. And then actually, no, it was fine to give myself permission to to kind of go, it, weeding is fine. I don't mind weeding. It's all right to do that as a job. And I'm quite happy. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, people, I talk to people and they go to me, oh, like I'll mention, mention something and they'll go, oh, you've got a degree. And uh, because I'm just there like sweeping their lawn, <laughs> you know, I was doing it like for 15 quid an hour, just like it's not sweeping their lawn, sweeping their back patio or mowing their lawn, uh, you know, and it kind of, but also I think maybe that there is a, a privilege that comes from having had an education and then a decent job and then chucking the towel in because you kind of know that you did it. And would I have been wow. in that same position had I come out of school and gone straight to sweeping patios and mowing lawns? Probably not. I probably would have always had that unscratched itch where it was like, you know, I need to go and educate myself. I need to get a good job. I need to work in the city. I need to try and have this high flying career. And I probably would have done it in reverse. I might have got the gardening job out of school and then gone and retrained and, you know, become a, a, a solicitor or something like, you know, a bit more, but more well paid. Mm. Who knows? But, I don't think probably there is a right and a wrong way to do it. And I think the journey that I've I've taken is was the one that I was meant to do. But yeah, no, I'm pleased I've ended up where I am now. What was the transition like once you realised that you needed to get out of your current job and into a new role? Did you know immediately that it was going to be gardening? I fell into it completely by accident. I um I was working in London and just had a total meltdown one day and I was with my partner at the time and I said to him you know I just don't know what to do I can't do this anymore and he said well, what do you like doing and I just went gardening <laughs> and he went well do gardening then and I was like 
yeah do you know what it is it is that simple I could mm-hmm. just do gardening so I carried on working for about another maybe six months a year and during that time I started doing my RHS qualifications remotely I was doing them on uh you know as a distance learning thing and then I moved down from out of London down to Sussex and I just started really at the bottom and I I volunteered to start with uh, mm-hmm. doing some gardening and then I took on some maintenance jobs then it just went from there so it was it was easy because I loved gardening and everything I did was gardening related and everything I still do is gardening related and so I just embraced it fully and mm-hmm. was so into it uh that I couldn't really fail because I had this like <laughs> massive enthusiasm and you know, desire to just do it all day every day and and immerse myself in it so from that point of view it was easy and yeah like you said I think once you find what you want to do everything just falls into place and you end up in the right place at the right time and opportunities arise and yeah I think I think that all sounds probably a bit hippie but yeah that's how it was for me. No I'm gonna I'm a hippie too. Like I'm going to even one up your hippiness and that is the place of not knowing where you are is also a, like that's fine to be in that place too. Like I spent many years in that place and everything's fine. Yeah, I agree. I don't know if I still know what I want to do. Yeah, that's what my dad always told me. You know, even when I was a kid before I graduated from high school, he used to say, son, I don't even know what I want to do and I'm X amount of years old, however old he, old he was when he told me that. I mean, he's just told me that recently again. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the idea that we can define ourselves to our role, that only really works for other people. We shouldn't be doing that for ourselves. You know, like if if a gardener comes to your house, maybe they are just a gardener to you. But if you're a gardener, you're more than that to yourself. You have to be because that's sad to be just defined by your role. Yeah, it is sad. You're right. Yeah, you definitely need to. You do need to have a passion for whatever you're doing. And sometimes I know you've got to pay the bills. I know that. I totally understand it. Sometimes I do things I don't necessarily want to do. But when you do actually just let go of the steering wheel and and let things go where they should go, I do think things have got a way of working it out. And also, you know, probably don't, don't sweat it too much if you're not where you think you should be or where you think you... Yeah, if you're not where you think you should be, because there is no should be about it. You just have to mm. you just have to go along for the ride, really. No, I couldn't agree more. I think that's a beautiful note to end it on, Sarah. Mm. Perfect. Yes. No, I think you're right. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I just have one more question that I always like to ask our guests. Is there anything else that you'd like the listeners to know about? I might talk to people about uh yes i think if i could just mention one more thing before i go i would like to mention the charity that i work for which is veterans growth and it is a horticultural therapy provider uh, based in east sussex in the uk and we work with uh, military veterans we have an amazing site here where they just come along and garden and got a really cool website we're on social media so um yeah if anybody would like to see how we garden here uh in a way that's really wildlife friendly and person friendly and you know we've got a lovely atmosphere down here it's a really nice site so yes please do uh check that out it's veteransgrowth.org is the website and veterans growth on all the social media channels so thank you for that thanks sarah and we'll have links in the show notes for any of our listeners that like to click through that way as well Thanks for coming on the show. That was awesome. Thank you very much for having me. It's such a nice chat. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode just as much as I did. You can search Roots and All on your favorite podcast listening app to hear Sarah's wonderful podcast and listen to some conversations that she's had with other plant nuts. Make sure you keep an ear out for next week's episode on the Plants Grow Here podcast where I'll be speaking with Philippa from the Forest Bathing Institute.
Yeah, so what's your day going to be like today? I am going to, it's very untypical because I've actually booked in a sports massage at one o'clock. So uh-huh. I've actually taken some time out of my week to do so for myself. So That's but, really uh, good. Yeah, I'm going to be, yeah, I know. I, it's, and it's not like me, like I say, so it's it's good to, it's good to do that, take mm. some time. Well, my big toe, the tendon that kind of connects my big toe to the rest of my, like down to my heel and all that, I'm just feeling that twinge today. So I think I could probably do with something like that. Mm. Yeah, well, I think the older I get, the more I realise I should really take care of myself because you only get the one body. So Exactly. When you you knacker it, that's it. Mm. You've had it. Totally. And I don't know about you, but I've seen that in people who can't afford to not do this. You know, they they don't have any other experience in anything else and they're just forced to just keep working even though their body's completely buggered. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was, you know, doing the same thing when I was doing just maintenance stuff, just working through it because there's no other option when you're self-employed. You you just have to get on with it. So, yeah, I understand that. Well, I work for... Companies. I mean, I'm working for a new company now, but I can relate with the being self reliant thing because my wife has a wedding invitation business and that's her basically full time job. And I sort of helped her set that up. And it it is scary when you are literally responsible for your own income. Yeah, well, you certainly notice that you don't ever take any time off sick. (laughs) You have no No. sick days in like (laughs) eight years. Thanks, Daniel, for a brilliant chat. And thanks to you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Please go and check out Plants Grow Here for more brilliant content from Daniel. And remember to visit harvest.co.uk and take advantage of a 5% discount on all four seasons and eco mini greenhouse orders from now until the end of July. Simply enter the code roots and all at the checkout. Now here's Dr. Ian Bedford on a pest that's been showing up a lot recently thanks to the rain. Gardens that contain a good assortment of plants, shrubs and trees will not only create ideal habitats for native wildlife, but they'll also make a great place to watch and learn about the biological systems that can evolve within gardens and how nature's food chains develop. And they'll demonstrate how crucial the herbivorous invertebrates are, forming the foundation level that supports all the creatures that feed on them further up the food chain. However, depending on the numbers and their feeding behaviour, The herbivores can sometimes become our plant pests and as such may need to be managed, preferably with environmentally friendly methods that work in conjunction with their natural predators. And a great example of this is the common garden snail, a ubiquitous mollusk that can be found in gardens throughout Britain, forever bonded to its distinctive light and dark brown shell. Garden snails are primarily nocturnal, feeding on soft-leaved vegetation from March to October, and relatively easy to manage as a plant pest, using physical barriers and non-toxic deterrents. But they're also an important species to have within a nature-friendly garden, as they're a food source for many other creatures, from ground beetles and centipedes to various mammals, birds and amphibians. And they're also quite remarkable creatures to spend some time just watching. Using polysaccharides and water, they create a path of slime to glide along, whilst constantly scanning their surroundings with two pairs of sensory tentacles. The upper pair, each with a little black eye spot, will be watching for danger, whilst the lower pair gently stroke the vegetation to find suitable leaves to eat. Then when found, the snail pushes out its radula, a ribbon-like tongue that's covered in thousands of tiny sharp teeth, which then rasp and shred the leaf into little pieces that are sent down its esophagus and into its stomach. Garden snails are also hermaphrodites, being both male and female. But despite all being able to lay fertile eggs, they prefer to find a mate. However, their mating process is rather strange, since it first involves the snails stabbing each other with a sharp calciferous dagger that they grow and conceal within their reproductive organs. 
The daggers, known as love darts, are pushed deep into each other's body, anchoring them together whilst they fertilise each other's eggs. The snails then separate to find shallow holes in the ground where they'll each lay around 80 spherical white eggs. After a few weeks, these hatch into perfectly formed miniature snails, which start to feed on the tenderest of plants. And over the following two years, for those lucky enough to survive the onslaught from natural predators and the boots of frustrated gardeners, they'll finally mature and lay eggs of their own. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.